Okay, uh, great. So let me start by telling you the main uh, theorem that I'm going to try to prove over the course of the lectures. Uh, so as Ben said, it's a theorem of Mirzakhani. And it says there is a measurable conjugacy Um, F, I'll call it, between uh, the earthquake flow and I'll tell you what that is later today but I'll just set up some notation now. So that sends a pair of a measured geodesic lamination and a hyperbolic surface to the same measured geodesic lamination but then the hyperbolic surface earthquaked uh, by time t. Um, and this is a flow on the space of measured laminations cross Teichmuller space. Um, so that's one of the flows. And the other flow is the Teichmuller unipotent flow. which is the action of 1t01 that uh, John and Barack have been telling you much about it. And this is a flow on the bundle that I'll just call QD of non-zero uh, quadratic differentials. And this is a bundle again, over Teichmuller space. Um, so what this statement means is, on the one hand, you have the bundle of quadratic differentials and this one parameter family of maps of t, that just unipotent flow for time t. And on the other hand, you have this thing which is probably much more mysterious to you, um, but you have this flow that earthquakes for time t that's a a flow on ML cross Teichmuller space. And then there's a map F from ML cross Teichmuller space to the bundle of quadratic differentials. And that it's a conjugacy means that this commutes. OK, and it's a, it's a measurable bijection. Um, OK, so that's the theorem. Um, I'll tell you about it uh, and some of the context for it over these three lectures. I've also written fairly detailed notes complete with over 20 figures uh, that are posted on the conference webpage. So I encourage you to take a look at the notes, since I'll be going uh, at a reasonable speed. Um, I do have time for lots of questions, so I hope you'll ask questions as they come up. Uh, so there's a few reasons why I chose to tell you about this. Um, uh, one is that. For many people like me, this picture is more familiar where you study unipotent flow. Certainly, it's more elementary to define. And yet, what this is saying is it's, you know, from a certain point of view, almost the same as this other perspective, uh, which is useful in its own right and has a different flavor. Um, uh, so, uh, and the, the wonderful thing about the proof is somehow it's ultimately not that hard or technical. It may be hard to assimilate. But it's a collection of fundamentally important facts and analogies. So you just you know, start to learn, well, this thing is analogous to this thing, and this is how I go in between them. And once you big, build a big enough dictionary, and once you're comfortable enough with the definitions, then it starts to seem quite clear that this unipotent flow and the earthquake flow are analogous to each other. Um, and you can get this uh, fairly easily once you know enough general facts. And all of those general facts are independently useful and interesting. Um, so this course will certainly connect to the course of uh, John and Brack on unipotent flows. Uh, it'll connect to Chris Leininger's general course on Teichmuller theory. Um, and it connects to a lot of other aspects of Teichmuller theory that you won't be hearing about, not just earthquake flows and unipotent flows. Um, OK. Uh, so uh, 
as I said, this is somehow the easier side. It's more elementary. It's better studied. This is the more mysterious side. And so one of the things you do with this theorem, which provides a bridge between the two sides, is you, you take facts here and transform them to facts here. Uh, so a corollary, for example, of this is that uh, earthquake flow is ergodic. Okay, it's well known that earthquake flow is ergodic, uh, or that unipotent flow is ergodic on the bundle of quadratic differentials. Um, and so hence you get the same thing here. Okay, and that also uh, brings to mind the question, what's the invariant measure here? But I'll talk about that later. I haven't even defined earthquakes yet. I don't think you can lift that. Um, hmm? Is it? OK. Um, OK, so uh, I'm going to start. All of today is going to cover background material. And a lot of the background material isn't, of course, due to Mirzakhani. A lot of it will be due to Thurston and Bonahan uh, and a lot of other people. Some of it is uh, old enough that it's hard, and hard to track down precise references. OK, so uh, I'm going to begin by talking about measured foliations and laminations. And this is fundamentally where this bridge begins. OK, earthquake flow somehow lives on the side of hyperbolic geometry, and unipotent flow lives on the side of flat geometry. And so what we're looking for is we're looking for ways to pass from flat geometry to hyperbolic geometry and, and vice versa. And it will start between the relation between foliations and laminations. Um, uh, so I think you've already seen this definition, but a measured foliation is a foliation with finitely many prong singularities so these singularities typically look like this uh, and a transverse measure so what a transverse measure does is here's the foliation and it allows you to assign a weight or a measure to any transverse arc with the property that um, the number you get is invariant under isotopies of the arc through transverse arcs where the um, endpoints stay on the same leaves. OK, so if you know about Quadratic differentials, a canonical example of this would be the horizontal foliation of a quadratic differential. Um, OK. Uh, so um, measured foliations are usually considered to be equivalent, equivalent if, well, one, if they differ by isotopies. That's sort of obvious if we're thinking about topological objects. Um, the next, though, is if they differ by whitehead moves. Okay, so a, a typical whitehead move would look something like this. So you could take a foliation that has a saddle connection, and you can contract the saddle connection and get a higher order prong. Um, and then you could also do this in the other direction. Okay, so if you're coming to the flat geometry world, this is an analog of splitting a zero of a quadratic differential. Um, OK, so uh, 
maybe let me remark out loud but not write it down. Most measured Foley don't have any saddle connections. They don't have any segments joining two of the prong singularities and hence don't admit any whitehead moves. Okay, so it's an equivalence relation but actually a lot of the equivalence classes have size one. Um, Yep. Yes. Um, uh, let's say no. Um, Okay, so uh, that's measured foliation. Now I want to talk about the hyperbolic geometry version of measured foliation, which is measured geodesic lamination. So a measured geodesic lamination uh, on a hyperbolic surface. X is a closed subset foliated by geodesics. OK, uh, and again, and a transverse measure. Okay, so there's a few differences. We no longer have singularities. That's one difference. And the other difference is the lines don't have to cover the surface. Okay? So um, the simplest example is I can take a multi-curve. And I can assign weights to it. So 1 times this plus pi times this plus 2 times this. That's an example of a, of a measured geodesic lamination. So it's a closed subset. Locally, it's, just, it's, it's covered by uh, disjoint geodesics. Um, and I have a transverse measure. Uh, and I'll tell you again in a moment what a transverse measure is in this context. But I, I think I should tell you a little bit more about what general um, uh, geodesic laminations look like. So uh, a typical geodesic lamination looks extremely complicated. Um, if I were to look at a little transverse arc of a typical geodesic lamination, um, so I look at that little arc, and then I look at all the intersection points of all the geodesics, it would look like a Cantor set. Okay, so it's you know, not so obvious uh, that these things exist. Um, what you're supposed to think is it's what you would get if you took sort of a, it's what an infinitely long uh, simple closed geodesic looks like. Okay, so you maybe could take a simple closed geodesic and then hit it with a pseudo-nosov over and over and over again, and it would start to look like a lamination. And in the limit, it would get really, really very complicated. Um, OK, so a transverse measure, again, is very similar to what it was before. In fact, I can basically draw the same picture, except we have to reinterpret it. So now I don't have a foliation. I don't have all of these horizontal lines. I just have some of the horizontal lines. And then I take an arc, and I isotope it. And if the endpoints are on the arc, then uh, they stay on the same arc, but you can also have the endpoints not be on an arc, uh, not be on a leaf of the lamination, and then it's just it, ca it can't cross a leaf because if you crossed a leaf, then it would change the measure of the transverse arc. Okay, so another picture upstairs: if you lift a lamination to the universal cover, then you get. Um, 
you know, this mess of closed geodesics. Uh, you can find some pretty pictures uh, online. Um, and so uh, you could remove the lamination, and you'd get countably many complementary regions. Okay, so those would have countably many leaves on them. But actually, there will be uncountably many leaves. It's analogous to the fact that in a Cantor set, there are only countably many points that are on the boundary of an interval, but the Cantor set itself is uncountable. OK. Um, so uh, Oh, so if I take, a, say, say take the standard middle thirds Cantor set, OK? So only, find, only countably many points lie on the boundary of a complementary interval. Right? So if I look at the interval minus the Cantor set, I get a countable union of intervals. So there are countably many points that are boundaries of intervals. Yet the Cantor set itself is uncountable. So that's analogous to here. I can take the geodesic lamination, which is like the Cantor set, and I can cut it out of the hyperbolic plane. Um, and now I get countably many regions that are bounded by geodesics. And those regions are like the intervals in the complement of the Cantor set. So I get countably many geodesics that bound regions. But that's not actually what a, a general geodesic in a lamination looks like. Um, a general geodesic would just be some sort of limit of such things. OK. Um, So I, I want to think a little bit um, now about the case again. So I have a lamination lambda. I've told you what happens if I look at the universal cover minus the lift of lambda. You get these countably many regions. I also want to think about what happens when you take the surface and you remove the lamination. OK, so now what you'll get, so this is, um, a finite union. So this will now be a finite union of pieces uh, that all have a very that are all bounded by infinite geodesics. So a finite union of connected components bounded by geodesics. OK, so it, it, it could look fairly simple. I could have something like this. This is a lamination. And I cut it out, and I get some, uh, some surfaces with closed leaves. But that's not actually the typical case. Typically, these will be infinite geodesics. So for example, the typical case actually would be that the regions are ideal triangles. Okay, that's the typical case. The, these complementary regions, they could also be ideal hyperbolic polygons with more, um, with more edges. They could be you know, not triangles, but have more edges. Uh, or they could even have topology. I'm not very good at drawing. OK, so it could be sort of a hyperbolic surface with this crown of spikes. And each spike is two asymptotic geodesics. And you see there are finally many, because all of these have to, this is the smallest one. This has area pi. So all of these are contributing some definite amount of area. So I can have at most finally many. Yeah? Uh, I'm not going to allow the surface to have cusps, because uh, this theorem is written in the case of no cusps. Um, these spikes, though, are sort of analogous to cusps. Oh, oh, I didn't draw the topology. <laughs> Sorry. I meant to draw the topology, and then I got distracted. Yeah. So these, you get uh, really many complementary regions. Um, yep? Because the surface has finite area. Why can't they be like ideal triangles? They can be ideal triangles. That's the typical case. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, in the typical case, You've sort of crammed as many geodesics as possible, and it's, it's a so-called maximal lamination. That'll be a very important notion for us. Um, and these guys are not maximal because I could add more geodesics to them. And I could find a geodesic here that does that or something. 
So these guys, you know, I could have put more geodesics onto the picture. And it turns out it's generic for it to have as many geodesics as possible in that the complementary regions are triangles. OK. Other questions so far? OK, so I want to think, um, well, I want to begin a discussion now that uh, partially resolve the fact that I'm doing this on a given hyperbolic surface. Okay, and I, I want measured laminations, geodesic laminations, to be analogous to measured foliations. But measured foliations are just done on a topological surface. It doesn't matter what the hyperbolic metric is. So now I want to have a discussion that will show that actually here it doesn't matter what the hyperbolic metric is either. Somehow I needed a hyperbolic metric to make the definition, but that was sort of like an auxiliary player, and I could have used a different hyperbolic uh, metric and got essentially... Um, the same set of laminations with some way of identifying them. Uh, and thinking about that will involve thinking about the, the universal cover again. So here's the hyperbolic plane, and its boundary is a circle. Okay? And a geodesic uh, you can think of as nothing other than a pair of distinct uh, boundary points. Okay, so geodesics in H, that's S1 cross S1. S1 is the boundary circle at infinity um, minus the diagonal. Okay? That's oriented geodesics. If you want unoriented geodesics, you should mod out by the involution that swaps the coordinates. OK. Um, now, uh, if x and y are two different points in Teichmuller spaces. So in other words, they're two different hyperbolic metrics. Um, then there's a natural map. Um, then there is a map uh, x to y. Actually, it's an isotopy class of maps. But coming from the marking, you had an isotopy class of maps from x to y. Um, and it lifts to a map uh, from the universal cover to the universal cover. So the first guy is the universal cover of x, and the second hyperbolic plane you think of as the universal cover of y. Uh, and this map um, moves points at most a bounded uh, distance in the hyperbolic metric. Or you can choose this map so that it moves um, points of bounded distance. Uh, and what this will do is it'll identify the boundary at infinity here with the boundary at infinity here. Okay, And so what that means is the space of geodesics on x is identified to the space of geodesics on y. Okay, and this sort of makes sense. We know this for closed geodesics. It only depends on the topology. Right? The closed geodesics on x correspond to the closed geodesics on y. And so it's similar with these simple geodesics. Somehow, if you know how the simple geodesic winds through the surface, then that's enough topological information to figure out the geodesic representative. Um, and there's exactly one geodesic representative on each uh, surface. OK. So. Um, this identifies identifies geodesic laminations on X with geodesic laminations on Y. Um, so uh, we'll just let ML be the set of, of measured geodesic laminations. Without any reference to a hyperbolic structure, because it doesn't matter. Uh, I'm confused the quantifiers in the statement about the map. Isn't it just some map from X to Y? Or is yes. You're saying any map? Well, no, there's, there's, a, there's an isotopy of map, class of maps coming from the marking. So there's sort of a topological surface 
that marks x and y. Yeah, and that map identifies the universal cover, the boundary of the universal cover of x with the boundary of the universal cover of y. Yes. So why why is points of I don't think I explained that well. Um, uh, let's just say that it identifies um, the boundary of the hyperbolic plane that's the universal cover of x with the boundary of the hyperbolic plane that's the universal cover of y. Yeah? Uh, I think yes. Um, Other questions? Uh, so ML is not a uh, canonically defined object. It is, well, um, you, so right now it's somehow I get one ML for each hyperbolic metric, and they're all canonically identified. I could define it in a, in a other way now, um, which is that I could define it to be some sort of measure on S1 cross S1 minus the diagonal where S1 is the boundary of sort of a topological universal cover. Um, and I, I could do it that way. Uh, so you could make a definition without referencing a given, given hyperbolic structure. Yeah. Essentially, the reason you get this identification is you get this, um, it's sort of a group equivariant map. Uh, so I have. You know, I have one hyperbolic plane and the other hyperbolic plane. And I have this map between them that I get from the universal cover. And say I define it to map this point to this, this point. And I take some other point way out here. And that's a pr approximately equal to gamma times something here. And so that map's way over here. Um, uh, yeah. OK. Um, so uh, I think I also forgot to notation to measured foliations. So MF is, uh, this is the set or space. So this is the set measured foliations. Um, and what we're going to want to see is these are the same. Okay, and that these are actually canonically identified with each other. Yeah? So they all, they all have uh, topology structure on it, or just a set? They, no, they actually have a natural topology um, that maybe I'll comment on later. Uh, they're actually very nice spaces. So remark um, MF is homeomorphic to R to the 6G minus 6. I don't know if Chris is going to do this in his course. Uh, no. Um, Anyways, and we're not going to use that, but it's actually a very, very nice space. Yeah. OK. So I, I want to go back to thinking about measured foliations. And then I'm going to tell you how to get a, a measured lamination from a measured foliation. OK. So define a line in a measured foliation um, is a non-singular uh, leaf of, of the foliation. And let's just say I'm lifting the foliation to the universal cover. So it's the universal cover of the, of the foliation. Um, or a limit of such. OK, so what's the picture? I have this foliation, and it has these singular points. Um, and I could take uh, 
a leaf that doesn't hit any singularity, so a non-singular leaf. Or I could take a leaf which is a limit and it goes through some of the singularities. Uh, um, uh, but uh, if there's a higher order zero, so here let's say there's a, a higher order zero to the foliation, um, then it could come in here, but it couldn't, for example, go out here, because that's not a limit of, of non-singular leaves. So a non-singular leaf has to go to one side or the other. And so that and that would be limits of non-singular leaves. But I couldn't sort of go out the backside. Okay. So for the people who are used to quadratic differentials, it's like uh, it has to make angle pi at every singularity. OK. Um, I think I'm just going to erase rather than put the board down. So lemma, every line determines a pair of points in S1. OK, so the, the point is this picture I drew here um, is actually accurate. The, in one direction, the line converges to one point, and in the other direction, the line converges to a different distinct point. Okay, so what's not happening is it's not, it can't bend around and get back to where it started, and nor can it sort of twist so much that it would accumulate on a whole interval of the boundary. Um, okay, so uh, So I'm not going to give a proof, but maybe I'll just give you an idea that will make it seem a little bit more reasonable. So the idea is to find some simple closed curves on the surface um, that the foliation only ever passes through in an efficient way. So a leaf of the foliation will never, double, will never cross this curve and then double back, and, and you know it'll never go like this. OK, so if it. I don't have, I can't cross and then go back without going through any topology first. I could cross, sort of go around that topology back. That's sort of an honest intersection. But I don't have any unnecessary intersections between the line and this curve. Um, so then what you think, you think of the picture in the universal cover. So uh, you want to find a curve that your, leaf, your line intersects infinitely often. OK, so it intersects the first time. And the lift of that red geodesic is this straight line here. Okay, So now it's never allowed to cross back over this line. And that's the same assumption that I'm not allowed to just turn around and go back, because that would give an unnecessary, that would give sort of a bygone. Um, and then it goes for a while. It does whatever. It's sort of confusing. But then eventually, uh, it crosses another lift, because downstairs it crosses that curve for a second time. Okay, and then it goes for a while, it does, you know, whatever it does, I don't know, and then it crosses a third time. Okay, and eventually um, these things are getting far away and they sort of corner it so that it's, it's stuck in that one little point there. Okay, so that's just a sketch of the proof. Yep? That's OK. This is still the picture. So it's another, it's another curve. Yeah, it, it just looks the same as this. The only bad thing would be if it crossed and came back. But then, even in the universal cover, you could sort of isotope it so it didn't intersect. And that would mean downstairs you could isotope it so that it didn't have that intersection. So yeah. yeah, exactly. Yep. Line, then never cross it so you have to you have to pick this curve appropriately. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I'm not giving you a proof, you. Um, 
But I think one can turn this into a proof if you want. Yeah, so you have to find a curve that, this will, that your line will intersect infinitely often. Um, OK. Um, so maybe I'll just comment. Uh, this lemma would be easier if I used a foliation that came from a quadratic differential. Because then I could say that the flat metric of the quadratic differential uh, was quasi-isometric to the hyperbolic metric. Um, but I don't want to assume that here. But that's maybe a little bit more, in, more intuition for you. So if this somehow came from a quadratic differential, then you would expect this path to be a quasi-isometry, like quasi-geodesic, quasi and then the quasi-geodesic tracks the geodesic. OK, so. But you use the fact that the foliation is measured to get the curve. Um, or is there a general case? I haven't thought about whether you could do it in the unmeasured case. Um, I've just never thought about unmeasured foliations that much. I suspect you could still do it, but I'm not 100% sure. I, I just don't know. OK, so what this gets us is we get a map from MF to ML. Okay, and this is the map. Um, so uh, I start with, with lambda, uh, no, not lambda, let's say mu a measured foliation. OK. And um, I lift it to the universal cover. And then I look at every line for that foliation. And I, it has two endpoints, and I replace that with the geodesic. OK. So look at the set of all geodesics in H joining endpoints of lines for this uh, to the universal cover. So here, where I had this line, I would then just take that hyperbolic geodesic. OK? And the result is a lamination of H. And because mu was invariant by some Fuchsian group, because mu tilde was invariant by some Fuchsian group, so will this lamination be. And you can also get the measure on this in a straightforward way. Why it's good? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, essentially because the set of lines is closed. This is why we had to use lines. You might want to make the definition just using simple leaves, that non-singular leaves, and then you wouldn't get something closed. But here you'll get something closed. You have to prove it. You could also just make the definition, oh, I'll just use non-singular leaves, and then I'll take the closure, and then you get something closed. And that would be fine, too. That's maybe an equally good way of thinking about it that's a little bit less uh, technical. Yeah? Yeah, in fact, most have uncountably many leaves. Just like a Cantor set. Just the, the Cantor set one just has one leaf, maybe. No, the Cantor set ones have uncountably many leaves. It goes back uncountably many times. But no, no, no. One leaf can only go someplace countably many times. Oh, yeah. Um, so the, yeah, the, gen the general lamination has uncountably many leaves. It's very rare for it to have only countably many leaves. Can you draw a picture of that on the surface? Of a lamination on the surface? Yeah, with on, uh, no. <laughs> I have some computer-generated pictures in my notes, but I, I had trouble finding even good pictures. I mean, really, you should just think about a Cantor set. If you can think about a Cantor set, you can think about a lamination. So think about a Cantor set, and then think about a Cantor set cross R, 
And like that's locally what a lamination looks like. Even if it's a counter burning, it looks very thin. But this one really look very fast. I mean, the, all the leaves here. Yeah, so the, the, this tightening creates a lot of space. OK, so this, let's, let's, um, let's think about what happens when I have a singularity of the foliation. And then it's not on any saddle connection. OK, so I have a singularity. So it looks like this. Um, so then what happens? So I take, here I have uh, three lines, one like this, like this, and like this. And then I tighten those, and I get an ideal triangle. Okay. So it creates space. It pulls apart that singularity and creates this space. This is actually a very important remark that's part of the dictionary I was referring to before. So um, simple singularities, so three-pronged singularities, uh, not on any saddle connections, give ideal triangles as complementary regions in the associated lamination. OK. Uh, yeah, so you'd think your generic foliation has simple, uh, simple singularities, so three-pronged singularities and no saddle connections. So what that will mean is all of the complementary regions will be triangles. OK. Yes? Yes. Yeah, you're thinking about the proof that you get something closed. Um. OK, so this is sort of the, 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 the beginning of the bridge that Mariam builds. Um, we have this map for measured foliations, which are really sort of live on the side of flat geometry, since the horizontal or vertical foliation of a quadratic differential is a measured foliation. Um, and it goes to measured laminations, which is in the world of hyperbolic geometry. Okay, and it's a sort of radical thing, right? Because you're essentially pulling the surface apart, and yet it's quite understandable at the same time. Okay, so how do you put the measure? Um, well, so here maybe I take an arc um, I take a transverse arc joining this line to this line. Okay? So then I tighten both of these. And then I get, where did that go? Uh, so the, the point is, upstairs, I don't really have to think about arcs so much. Um, really, if I just give you two leaves, then there's a unique isotopy class of transverse arcs joining those two leaves. OK, so this arc business is somehow to keep track of which way it gets from one leaf to the other, since it doesn't matter how I slide along the endpoints. And upstairs, there's just one way. So I really have this, really, upstairs, I just have these two uh, leaves, and I want to know what's the measure of the set of leaves in between them. And then those get tightened to these two leaves, and I need to know what's the measure of the set of leaves or geodesics in between them, and I just define it to be the same thing. The same number. Yeah, so there's a number corresponding to these two uh, geodesics which is the transverse arc of the set of geodesics in that go in between them. And there's a number corresponding to these two leaves, which is the transverse measure for all of these, uh, for an arc joining them. And I just say, this number, which I have to define, is equal to this number. It seems that all the lines that give the same geodesic produce a, uh, a mass concentrated on the geodesic. Um, From the picture, it seems that you have many, many lines 
You don't typically. Yeah. Yeah, you do in rare situations like for a stable differential, um, but you don't in general. Yeah? Did you mean that the merit correlation is a proper subset of merit lamination in some sense is injective? Ah, so it, it is injective. Um, so now there's a theorem. Uh, this map, which is sometimes called the tightening map, is a homeo. So I have this map that goes from MF to ML, and it's actually a homeomorphism. So it's better than injective. It's the same thing. Uh, oh, can you give a common topological definition? Yeah, you could try using boundary cross boundary minus diagonal and thinking about measures on that that are group equivariant. I mean, if you want, OK, everything is a current. But I'm not actually talking about currents right now. Yeah. So what's the free image of that animal? Oh, of this guy? Yeah. This, would be a diff this would be a surface built out of three uh, horizontal cylinders. That's a, that's a for the obvious okay. Yeah. OK. Yeah, that's, that's essentially the only time when you have a bunch of mass get, that gets concentrated onto an atom when you have a cylinder. Yeah? Do you need to consider measured foliations up to isotopy of the foliation? So I left out part of the definition. It's actually measure equivalent. But okay. let me address this later. We have intersection number. OK. Um, yeah, somehow if you had you know, several curves, you have to be able to consolidate them into one curve. Mm. That's part of the, the equivalence relation. OK, so, um, so I, d I don't actually know any super short proof of this, but let me give you an idea of uh, why this is true. So, Sorry, just about topology, maybe I just, you said it, but I missed it. For measured laminations, we could just think about uh, S1 cross S1 minus diagonal. Yeah. Uh, and for measured foliations? Um, really, all of this will be easier once I've defined intersection number. OK. Um, OK, uh, so uh, idea of why this theorem might be true. So, uh, so you want to build an inverse map. OK, that will get from a measured foliation to a measured, uh, from a measured lamination to a measured foliation. OK, so. Suppose lambda in ML uh, is maximal. And this is a very important definition for this, for us. So um, x minus lambda consists of triangles. Okay, so maximal is in sort of it has you can't add any more geodesics to it. Some people also call this complete. Um, so I'm just going to build the inverse in this case. Um, so uh, what you want to do then is you want to collapse. So collapse every triangle. onto a spine. So what does that look like? So here I have a triangle, a complementary triangle. Um, and I draw in the spine. And then I just collapse it. So I sort of just pinch the triangle down onto that. Okay, and then. When you do this, you actually get um, a measured foliation. Right? So the, the reason a measured lamination is not a foliation is because the leaves don't cover the surface. Okay, you have these complementary regions. So you just get rid of the complementary regions. And I imagine this seems rather radical to you if you haven't seen it yet. But I want to compare it to something uh, 
that's a little easier to understand. So compare to the following. Um, let mu be one of the standard measures on a Cantor set. Okay, so it's the standard measure on the middle thirds Cantor set, for example. Okay? So it's a nice Borel measure, but it's supported on the Cantor set. Um, and then look at the function uh, from, say, the interval to itself that maps x from the integral from 1 to x of 1 d mu. OK, and think about this. So I have my Cantor set, and I have the complementary region. So say here's x. If I move x over a little bit to x prime, this integral doesn't change, because there's no support of the measure on this complementary uh, interval. Okay? So this collapses all of the complementary intervals. Okay? And again, that seems drastic, in that you know, the whole interval is complementary intervals, and you collapse them all, so you've collapsed everything. So why do you get something reasonable? Um, and yet, this is undeniably a monotone map from R to R. So it maps um, this onto the interval. And furthermore, if you pick two points, x and x prime, that are actually in the support, then they map to different things, because there's some measure in between them, unless they're on opposite sides of an interval. So this collapses the complementary intervals, and it doesn't collapse anything else. Um, and you still get a very nice object. It's just the interval as a result. So what this collapse map is, it looks like you're doing that in the transverse direction. Yep? Well, so you have to give a definition. How do you, how do you actually do the collapse? You pick away. So you could maybe just look at like the, um, I mean, we'll talk about this actually a lot later. But you maybe pick one standard way once and for all for a triangle, like basically a closest point projection or something like that. Anything that will be continuous. Um, and then you do that. Would you take core cycles? That's the real way. That's the big part. We'll talk about this next time. So yeah, it would be a little bit complicated in the case you had quadrilaterals. It would be more complementary, complicated in the case that you had complementary regions with topology. Okay? Now you could take your measured lamination and ex extend it to a, a sort of fake maximal measured lamination, in that you could put in extra geodesics until it was maximal, but those geodesics have zero mass, which usually we don't allow. Usually our measure is full support. And if you do that, then you can do this to get a quadratic differential for any measured um, lamination. But then you had many different choices of how to fill it in, and you need to show that the measured foliations you get are dif differ only by whitehead moves. And so that's where this gets a little bit more complicated. So it's, did you get measured foliation already? Is yeah, so what, all you do is you do this collapsing, and you get a measured foliation. But by the fibers of that collapsing? The, yeah, so um, you collapse, and then you get uh, fo you, then what you're left is just a foliation of, it, oh, of the, but the but surface. It, but, the square, but the composition of these two maps is not identity. Right? It is the identity. It is the identity? Yeah. Weren't we stretching out the leaves? So the foliation yeah, so you s one is right? tighten the leaves, and the other one is... So tightening the leaves, when you do this map, it creates these intermediate spaces. Yes. And then the inverse deletes the intermediate spaces. I feel like if you draw for a... So it's sort of like... the This is like tighten... And um, that sort of inflates, uh, it inflates these triangles that were sort of, really that was like three saddle connections that what was inflated to a triangle, and then this inverse map collapsed it back down. So the foliation that you, repl you replace that lamination with is given by four cycles from those three points. Is that okay, well, the, the key thing... Um, No, 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 because the, these become leaves of the foliation. These become leaves. Yeah, those become, so the leaves of the measured foliation are just the image of the leaves of the measured lamination. Yes? Yeah? Yeah, so you have to then glue the triangles together. 
Yep. So if you'd like, I'm defining an equivalence relation where this point is defined to be equivalent to that, um, and then you collapse by things of that. But actually, for a general lamination, each leaf is only on one triangle, for a generic one. It's, it, there's not a triangle on both sides. There's just a triangle on one side. Yeah, that'll you'll end up with a foliation. It seems weird, but it's really, I insist, I'm not giving a proof, but I really insist it's no weirder than this. You know, you collapse almost everything in the interval and you get an interval back. So here you started with this foliation, you collapsed almost everything and you get a, an actual foliation rather than a partial foliation. Okay. Yep. Then you would somehow take parallels of this. Uh, that would be your foliation. Yeah. So that's a bit of a. That's the, yeah. Yes. And these guys, and they would somehow fill almost the whole surface. Yeah, and then you'd have some saddle connections on the boundary. That's actually almost but the hardest you, case. But would you would you give them some? I mean, which one would have some weight now? All of them or none? Or? Yeah, all of them, the total weight across. So we would give a cylinder, and the height of that cylinder would be the transverse measure of the curve. But if I have just an arc, you know, from between two points, then I don't know what measure to give to that one. Yeah. Um, well, the, those points, uh, I mean, all of that intermediate space gets collapsed. Colla it's sort of different when you have closed curves. This is really an outline in the case of a maximal lamination, um, which is the generic case, but then there are no closed curves. So I think that because there is an equivalence, the equivalence that is similar to white hat equivalence that works for uh, married lamination that we didn't mention. It's like a one curve married three is equivalent to three curve married one. Um, I, yeah, I think that's just built into the definition of a, oh, okay. uh, of a measured okay. lamination. OK. Um, and you can also use train tracks to build the inverse also. Uh, the idea is you find a train track that supports it, and then you sort of think about, e you replace each uh, edge of the train track with a rectangle of the appropriate height, and now you have a partial foliation. And now you have to collapse the rest of the surface. But it seems a bit more reasonable, because you at least have some like, you know, rectangles, which is some positive measure set of the surface. Um, OK. So uh, So now I want to talk about the intersection form. So there is an intersection form. Uh, form or intersection number, and it's a function. ML to R greater than or equal to 0. OK, and uh, it's easiest to define this when my la laminations are multi-curves. When my laminations are multi-curves, this just counts intersection. Where if I have an intersection of something with measure A with something of measure B, then that gets AB. So that counts as AB. Um, and so actually, you can prove that uh, multi-curves are dense in ML. And this intersection number is the unique continuous extension of it. There are also other nice direct definitions that are pretty easy. Uh, for example, using the same way you do it for currents would work. Um, OK. And since ML is the same thing as MF, we also get an intersection number on MF. Uh, and uh, really, this once you have this, it sort of simplifies a lot of the the um, discussion, two foliations give the same point in MF if and only if they have the same intersection number with every simple closed curve. And the topology is the topology where all these intersection numbers are continuous. OK. Um, but, but I want to talk about one moment what this is in the MF case. So if alpha is an MF and beta is a simple closed curve, the intersection number of alpha and beta is the following. So 
It's some sort of inf mf. I want to talk about it for a moment in the case of mf. I could say, well, I have it for ml, and so I have it for mf because it's the same, but I want to be a little bit more concrete. Yeah, that's, I, uh, yeah. If you want, I consider this to be a measured lamination and this to be a measured lamination, and I take their intersection number. But you can also define um, the intersection number directly for something in a measured foliation and a, a curve. And that's what I'm doing now. And it'll give you the same thing as if you represent them both as laminations and then take the intersection number there. Um, OK. So what you do is, so I have the, the, the foliation with some prong singularities. And then um, I take beta, and I realize it by finitely many arcs that are transverse to the foliation. And then I sum up the measures of those arcs. Okay. So the sum of measures of arcs, and it's the inf over uh, alpha prime isotopic to alpha, a union of transverse arcs, uh, beta. Yeah. So I just I look at all ways of realizing beta as a finite union of transverse arcs, and I add up the measures of those, and then I take the inf. And that's the intersection number. In, if you're lucky, beta is just transverse to alpha, and then it's just the, that measure. Um, but this is how you would do it in general. OK. So what is both sides are measured lamination? Sorry? What is both, both, side, both, both, both sides are measured lamination? Um, well, if you want one definition, then you could sort of break up their intersections into rectangles or parallelograms. And so you could sort of tessellate the surface by rectangles or parallelograms whose edges are uh, leaves of the lamination. And then you say, OK, this rectangle, how much intersection is happening in this rectangle? Well, it's fairly clear. It should be the transverse measure of this arc times the transverse measure of this arc. Other questions? Okay, actually, I think I've used up my hour, so I should stop here. Uh, and next time, we'll continue. So, so far, we've built up part of the dictionary from flat geometry to, quadratic, to hyperbolic geometry by learning how to go be forth between foliations and laminations. And next time, we'll do a version of this uh, where you have quadratic differentials. All right, thank you.